Serial murderer Gary Ray Bowles spent the year of 1994 charming men in gay bars, offering them sex in exchange for money. Once inside their homes, Gary would surprise them by bashing their head in with whatever object was closest to him. More horrifyingly, though, was when he would finish them off. Most of his victims ended up suffocating from having various objects shoved down their throats. Gary slayed six men, but the police knew exactly who he was after just the first murder. It would take them eight months to finally identify him as what they were calling the I-95 killer, but only after Gary revealed himself to them. How was he able to conceal his identity and evade police even when sitting directly across from them? Today we'll discuss how Gary was able to do this and why he's remembered as one of the most horrific killers police have ever encountered. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, Brief and Bingeable True Crime. My name is Joe, the host, and thank you for joining today. If you're new, subscribe so that you can more easily get connected with the just released episodes. It also helps to subscribe if you're in binge mode, when you're gobbling up a bunch of episodes in a row, and maybe you need to take a break. If you're subscribed, when you come back to it, 10 Minute Murder is more easily accessible. A reminder about the new email address if you want to contact me for any reason whatsoever, joe at 10minutemurder.com and the website with links to all the things 10minutemurder.com uh, pretty recently I did an episode called The Devil Made Me Do It and after I did that episode several people reached out and asked for clarification of how I actually feel about demonic possession and things like that and I mentioned in the episode that I believe in it uh, but I don't really believe in this whole it feels like kind of scammy to me uh, like people are making money on this whole demonic possession thing. And I don't know the angle of it or how it exactly works, but it feels scammy to me. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and I mentioned in the episode that I believe in it, but I don't believe in it a whole bunch. But I will say this. I kind of think Ouija boards are bogus, but I'm not going to let them in my house. Are they real? Maybe. Probably. And here's the thing. I don't think anyone's life has ever been improved by a Ouija board. There's never been, in the history of people, someone stressed out and not doing well, and then they start swiping around and communicating with ghosts, spirits, and demons, then suddenly their life is hunky-dory. So, no Ouija boards in my house. That's a hard and fast rule. Okay, now let's get to the story today. Born on January 25th, 1962, Gary Ray Bowles lived with his mother in Clifton Forge, Virginia. His father died at a young age from black lung disease, and his mother remarried several different men. Probably not all at the same time. Gary told investigators that several of his stepfathers physically and mentally abused him. When he was just 13 years old, he fought back against one of his stepfathers, smashing a rock in his head and nearly killing him. When he was 14, he ran away from home sick of the constant abuse. On his own now, at 14, years old, Gary had to hitchhike to travel places. A motorist picked him up and introduced him to prostitution. This motorist took advantage of young Gary himself and then convinced him that this was the easiest and quickest way to earn money. From there, Gary would drift around the country, turning tricks for as little as $10. As he aged, Gary found himself in and out of jail for petty theft crimes. In 1982, though, he was sentenced to eight years in prison after beating and raping his girlfriend. He had several different girlfriends over the years who were unaware of his occupation, but one eventually found out. When Gary moved into a Daytona Beach apartment after being released from prison, he got one of his new girlfriends pregnant. It's unclear how she discovered that he was hustling gay men, but when she did, she abruptly left town. This made Gary furious, and he didn't take it well it sent him down a much more violent path. In March of 1994, when Gary was 32 years old, he frequented bars populated with gay men in Daytona Beach. This is where he would meet 59-year-old insurance salesman John Hardy Roberts. At this point, Gary was looking for a place to stay. John, a single gay man, was looking for company. So the two began their relationship in John's beachfront home. But Gary was still pretty upset about the previous girlfriend, and John wasn't happy about that. On March 14th, John gave Gary an ultimatum. It was either him 
or his ex-girlfriend, to which Gary would bash John's skull in with the lamp. He then tightly rolled up a towel and stuffed it down John's throat. Gary left the house in John's 1992 Saturn. However, he left behind a letter from his probation officer with his name and address on it. The police found this lying directly beneath John's body. With their suspect being identified, the police followed the trail of transactions and security camera sightings with John's ATM card. He traveled from Daytona Beach to Nashville, but the trail stopped right there. More victims would pile up before the police would eventually catch up to him. Just a few weeks later, David Allen Jarman, a 39-year-old loan officer, was last seen leaving a gay bar in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., with a man resembling Gary beside him. After he failed to report to work the following day, loved ones discovered him in his home, lying in a pool of his own blood on April 14, 1994. The crime was very similar to the murder of John Roberts, along with an eyewitness citing Gary outside of the bar with David. However, Gary was quick. He was already on I-95 South, headed towards Savannah, Georgia. He began frequenting gay bars again. It's unclear why Gary solely targeted gay men. He did confess that he hated them, but he didn't specify why. His next victim was one he met at another bar, 72-year-old Milton Bradley. He was a disabled World War II veteran and he was left mentally incapacitated from an explosion. He was described as being a kind and gentle old man who enjoyed feeding pigeons in the park. When Gary met him on May 4, 1994, he offered to give Milton a ride home from the bar, but instead of driving him home, Gary drove him to behind a golf course where there was a shed. This is where he bludgeoned Milton with the lid of an old toilet and suffocated him by stuffing his throat with leaves. Gary's next two victims were less than a week apart. 47-year-old Alverson Carter was found stabbed to death on May 13th, and then on May 19th, 38-year-old Albert Morris's body was found gagged, beaten, and with a shotgun blast to the head. After these two murders, Gary was put on the FBI's most wanted list. The FBI noticed the pattern of all the victims being older gay men who socialized at gay bars, with most of them having objects that snaked down their windpipes. And the murderer always stole their car and credit cards and would leave a trail of transactions along Interstate 95. Gary was aware of the nationwide manhunt, broadcasted all over in the newspapers, on television, and he knew he needed to disguise himself. This is when he became Timothy Whitfield. He stole the real Timothy's identity after finding all of his personal documents in the home of one of his victims. Gary got a new driver's license under this name and began working as a day laborer and renting an apartment. At one point, his landlord suspected him to be the I-95 killer, but Gary convinced him he only resembled that man. Gary was even arrested and jailed several times for Timothy's, the actual Timothy's, outstanding warrants for petty offenses, but the police were oblivious of his true identity. On November 16, 1994, Gary would commit his last murder. After luring 47-year-old Walter Hinton from another gay bar in Jacksonville, Florida, Gary bashed the man's head with a 40-pound concrete block. Walter's body was found with toilet paper jammed down his throat. When police arrested Timothy Whitfield in connection to the murder of Walter Hinton, they were unaware of who they were truly investigating. However, shortly into the interrogation, the suspect leaned in close to the detectives and gave them his real name, Gary Ray Bowles, the horrific serial murderer who's been evading the FBI in three states for eight months. The police were stunned. The notorious I-95 killer was sentenced to death in 1996. He spent the next two decades in a six-by-nine-foot cell before the day of his execution. He requested cheeseburgers, fries, and bacon for his last meal, and no family visited him. On August 22, 2019, Gary Ray Bowles, the I-95 killer, was executed by lethal injection in the Florida State Prison. Instead of his last words, he offered a written statement to the media saying, quote, I'm sorry for all the pain and suffering I've caused. I never wanted this to be my life. You don't wake up one day and decide to become a serial killer. That's 10-minute murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. 
Thank you for listening. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, if you are not yet subscribed, please take a moment and do that right now. Wherever you're listening, hit the subscribe button. Now, it doesn't always say subscribe. It might say collect or follow, or it might just outright say subscribe. Whatever it says, hit that button. And that makes sure of a couple of different things that, first of all, you get all of the episodes as soon as they are released and you don't have to wait around and maybe it's going to download, maybe it's not. It's just right there. As soon as you open the app, 10 Minute Murder, boom, new episodes right there at the top. And also, it helps if you're binging episodes. If you uh, have to take a break for whatever reason from binging the episodes. I mean, there are, I don't know, like, I think this is like episode 237. Uh, I might be wrong about that number, but it's pretty close to that if I am wrong. But there are a lot of episodes, so you might get lost in the mix of these episodes. If you subscribe, you automatically will come back and you'll uh, you'll see the podcast right there. You don't have to go searching and trying to remember was it 11 minute murder? I don't know. Larry, was it 11 minute or 12 minute murder? I don't know. And then, you know, you just never find it again. You're lost forever. But if you subscribe, then, you know, you and Larry will be able to find the podcast easily. I don't know who Larry is, but I'm sure he's a nice guy. Also, if you want to see visuals that go along with the episodes, uh, that I don't post anything graphic or gross. I don't want to see that. I assume that you don't either, but I do post the pictures of uh, places and people and you know, situations, crime scenes that don't involve a bunch of blood and guts. Uh, I put that on all the social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And if at any point you get confused about well, where did he say to go to do this, 10minutemurder.com. It has all the stuff. Thank you for listening. Be safe and make good choices. <laughs>